Okay, in this session, we're going to uh, talk specifically about the impacts to our facilities that um, have been caused by the experience that we've all had together in, in uh, dealing with the viral spread that we have over the past numbers of months, uh, not just in, in the places that we live, but around the world. And so we're going to talk specifically today about some of the things that we can consider. One of the things that's going to be very important for us to consider as we start this is that it's really not just about us. And we, we may be young and healthy and in good shape, uh, but thinking about it in terms of those that are the most vulnerable. Uh, my, my thinking was adjusted on this. Um, I really questioned whether or not I needed to be wearing a mask personally because I felt like I was in pretty good shape. I bike, I hike, uh, didn't really have any lung ailments. My health is good. And then I talked to my daughter, who is a type 1 diabetic, who is the mother of two sons, and she was terribly afraid as a diabetic, being in a vulnerable population, that she was not going to be able to see her sons, my grandsons, grow up. And it changed the way that I thought. So thinking outside of ourselves and thinking for the needs of others is a very important consideration as we think about our facilities. We're springing from the scripture from Philippians 2, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So that's going to be something we're going to be thinking about as we go about doing um, the assessment of our facilities, is how do we think about it in terms of the most vulnerable, the ones that are really challenged to think about how do I come back to a large group environment in a church and, uh, and do it safely. So uh, what are some of the things that we can specifically do to address those concerns? One of the things that is uh, at the top of our minds when we talk about this is improving air, indoor air quality. Um, back in the 19, early 1990s, a lot of the codes changed to bring a requirement into our buildings that caused us to think about uh, air in a very different way. Uh, I, I know that and oftentimes I find myself going into older facilities and I've joked for a long time that when I go into a facility that does not have proper air movement or air exchange, frankly it tends to smell like old guys, old men. And now that I am one of those old men, uh, I, I find myself um, wondering what are some of the things that we can do to improve the air quality or the odors and the smells and the, uh, the oxygen levels, frankly, in, in the building. Well, the codes have demanded over the past 25 years plus or so that we have 15 cubic feet per minute of air delivered per occupant. And when you, when you have a room that has perhaps hundreds of people or, or beyond that, uh, the amount of air exchange is a phenomenal amount of air. So um, those things have happened over that period of time to improve air quality uh, but there's other things that we can do to even enhance that more to take care of some of the viral spreads that are uh, plaguing our population in the current times. One of the things that we want to focus on is introducing simple things like this plasma air ionization unit. Uh, these, these kinds of units are relatively inexpensive. They can be put into the pathway of the airflow inside a duct and in essence, what they do is they change the molecular structure of the air to cleanse the air of all the particulates, the viruses, the bacterial um, aspects, uh, the uh, volatile organic compounds, VOCs that occur within air, uh, at the same time that they're changing the molecular structure from CO2 to an oxygen level that replenishes the air to make it more healthy. Uh, these are very inexpensive uh, items that can be added to any existing system and really improve the air quality. So thinking about these kinds of simple things that we can add, um, there are independent tests on this too that you can study to understand what the scientific principles are behind doing these kinds of things. Uh, very simple things that can be added into your air. The other nice thing about putting an ionization unit into your ductwork path is that you don't need to exhaust as much air out of your building to satisfy these codes that were changed to bring this amount of fresh air into a building. And so when you treat the air, instead of exhausting all the treated air that you've invested energy into out of the top of your building, instead now 
that air is retained and re replenished and, and used throughout the space. So you're saving the energy that's been invested in that air and you can reduce the, the amount of tons of cooling. That's the way that HVAC units are rated. We can reduce that by about 20 to 25 percent. When you, when you consider that a ton of cooling oftentimes translates to a cost of between $4,000 and $5,000 per ton, and you've, you've got a 30-ton unit that can be reduced to a 24-ton unit because the introduction of a plasma air ionization unit that not only improves the air quality, but now we're saving something in the neighborhood of twenty-five dollars to $30,000 on that unit. That's a phenomenal savings. And so if, even if you're not trying to improve the air, this is something that we can do to improve the cost for the project. Another strategy that we want to uh, talk about that in some circumstances, um, it may make sense to deliver air to the space in a way that is a very unconventional way of bringing fresh air into a room, fresh treated air. Uh, this system is called underfloor air delivery. It is oftentimes used, or when it is used, it is oftentimes used in circumstances where there's large group spaces um, or open areas in, within a building, such as worship centers or uh, large group gathering spaces like third place lobby foyer type spaces. The slide that you're looking at right now explores two different ways of delivering air. A conventional way on the left is by overhead air delivery. Oftentimes air is delivered high in a room. It's brought in at high velocity. Uh, most times in large group spaces that air is in a cooling mode and the air is charged and roiled through the space at high velocity to bring the air down to the occupiable level of the building where, where the people are. And so the air gets mixed, it's spread, and of course, as we breathe, everything we breathe in and out is also shared and spread throughout the room. Uh, this is a conventional way of doing it. When you walk into a room, if you'll notice, you'll look up and you'll see uh, supply air diffusers up high in the space and typically a return air down low or perhaps in a different part of the upper portions of the room. The underfloor air delivery system brings air in at the, f the feet. And some of the advantages of bringing it in at the feet is that instead of bringing cool air in at 53 degrees up in the highest temperature portions of the room, you're now bringing air in at 63 degrees and you're bringing it in at very low velocities. So lower fan speeds, higher temperatures translates into energy savings. And when the air comes in, that air migrates laminar in a laminar fashion up through the space and the, the significant amount of air that is shared is largely reduced or eliminated from an overhead air delivery system. So the people in the space tend to, to breathe the air, but it's then returned into the system and it's cleansed before it's returned back and charged back into the plenum space occurring below your feet. Uh, a very interesting way of providing air to a space. And the studies that have been done in this area have shown significant improvements into the air delivery system. So oftentimes um, raised access systems are employed to do this. A lot of individual control can be brought into the room too. If it's an open work environment, uh, everybody can have their own sense of, of the way that they deliver air to their particular space. So a very interesting way to, to bring air in. But it's largely charging an air plenum that's occurring below the floor. Uh, the envelope sizes can be reduced by doing this because you're not providing large amounts of ductwork up in the space. You are going to pay a little bit more for the um, raised access system, but by the elimination of most of the ductwork in the building, you can bring a savings on that side to offset the cost of the raised access system. So you get the benefit of 20 or 30 percent energy savings. You get improved air quality. And, uh, and you save money at the same time. So, so maybe this makes sense for a space. All of these have to be looked at in terms of the way that the space is utilized. Another thing that's gonna be very important for us to think about is the way that we think about spatial layouts, uh, trying to avoid some of the conflict points that occur within a building. Now, I've said for years that a lot of churches evolve very sequentially where you come into a space A and then to get from A to E, in the building, you've got to go through B, C, and D to get to E. And sometimes that entails that the family or the individuals that are in the ministry organization are going down narrow corridors and hallways, and they're, they're in very close proximity to one another. 
What we're suggesting by this diagram that you're seeing now is a different way to organize space, where people come into generous space, open central space, what we would call third place space. Uh, we'll describe at some point the, the notion of third place, but think of third place as your lobby for your space on steroids. It's large space where people can gather, they can keep social distancing, but everything that the ministry has to offer in terms of a ministry opportunity, whether that be children's ministries or worship, or uh, education spaces or uh, needing to go to administration spaces or simply to go get a cup of coffee or to the restroom and so forth. All of those are visually available when you come into that space. So we largely eliminate a lot of the tight circulation corridors that can happen within a building. So it's just a different way. In the past, we've talked about the 80% rule. When a space is 80% filled, it's effectively fully filled because people won't fill in the gaps. That may change. If you look around some of the churches that have already opened up in uh, this post-viral uh, time period, you'll see much greater spaces being afforded uh, to, to the room. So the, the old 80% may turn into a 60% is considered to be a full space. We may need to think about the way that we allocate space a little bit differently. That also has to do with our foyers and our lobbies. In years past, uh, our churches were equipped with narthex spaces. A narthex was a small space, roughly 5 to 8% of the size of the worship space. And as time has gone on, that space has grown and grown more uh, to become a different kind of space where people can gather together uh, what I would call the sort of the seeds of discipleship begin to be born in this space where relationship creation is happening, where connection is happening when people come into that space. So it's space that precedes worship or precedes the event and uh, following the event, space where people can gather aside. So this space is going to be thought of in a very different way. The way that people move in and out of spaces connected to this has to be thought of in a very different way. Instead of 5 to 8%, now we're talking about much larger percentages that would be dedicated to that. Uh, you, can, you can see in these, uh, these slides that we're showing now that these can be very crowded spaces. We're going to need to think about how to allocate more space or how do we um, allow people to keep their separations. The whole notion of using movable glass partitions, too, what, that when it comes time to have mass exodus, that partitions can be opened up and allow people to move freely without crowding one another. Uh, the way that people move through the building is going to be considered in a very different way. Or the use of overhead doors uh, in a space. This is a, a project that we did down in California in Escondido where they, uh, they open up the doors. Not only are there uh, conventional uh, hinged doors to the left and the right, but we can also open these, these central doors up, these overhead doors up, and allow people to migrate through the space very easily without uh, getting into close proximity. Even on the interiors of the spaces, how we, we use overhead doors to be able to open a space up and allow people to move in and out very freely and very easily. So thinking the way that, that we uh, exit a space, too, is going to be very important, providing more opportunities for people to come out of the room instead of pinch points, creating pinch points in the space. That's going to be very important for us to consider. Or the way that we check uh, a family into a space, uh, providing a little bit more distance. In the past, maybe these kiosks where a family would come in to bring information into the uh, ministry organization about their child, maybe they need to be spaced a little bit differently. Uh, maybe we, we need to think about the way that we uh, organize these kinds of kiosk opportunities. You can see in this particular circumstance that instead of lining these up where, where families are in very close proximity, there's good distance apart, about 12 feet apart on these that allow that social distancing to continue on. Thinking about um, the merging, too, of, of, of indoor and outdoor space, creating these transition zones. Uh, this particular project shows a way to take indoor space and largely open it up into what I would consider to be the front porch of the project. So again, uh, this, these doors can be opened up, overhead doors are employed, and people can generously move from indoor to outdoor space very freely and readily without getting into close proximity of one another. Or creating outdoor spaces, that third place experience can be created on the outside of a building. Uh, we've got several projects uh, underway right now where, we, uh, the, and these were actually conceived of prior to the viral spread that we're experiencing now, that allow people to gather on the outside, have some shade, maybe some air movement on the outside created by, by large fans and so forth, 
but allows them to extend the foyer space or the third place space to the outside of the building. Um, cheaper to do it that way and uh, in many climate zones really conducive to being allowed to, to use this outside space as an extension to the indoor space. I think also uh, we need to think a little bit more earnestly about the way that uh, we deal with things in high touch areas, the kinds of materials that we employ into those zones. Uh, oftentimes uh, we're able to find things where um, a lot of uh, individuals will be touching a common element uh, using materials that are antimicrobial -mic so that we don't have germ spread. Uh, the use of hands-free door openers, you've perhaps seen these. These have been used in some locations like airports for a long period of time where people can come in and either not have a door uh, where they can come into a restroom environment without having to touch anything or to employ something like these hands-free door openers that allow people to come in. Uh, same thing for the accessories that go on when they come into the space, making sure that there's uh, sensors on the equipment, whether it be a sink or a soap dispenser or uh, the, the fixtures themselves that we utilize to use the restroom, making sure that those are hands-free. And making sure, too, that they, the, the systems are set up so that you're not constantly having to go in and maintain those, but that they are really good, employable systems that work readily and uh, don't pose problems for the maintenance staff. Making sure that we have you know, a consistent use of hand sanitizers. That's become part of the regimen of going into a building nowadays, is making sure that our hands are kept clean and that there's opportunities for us to continue to, to attend to those kinds of issues. So there's a lot of different areas that this can touch. Um, certainly as we get into a design, we'll, we'll get into this more, but these are all good suggestions to be considered, whether it be um, the air quality that we're addressing, whether it be the materials that are being used in the building, um, or the way and the patterns of movement through a building and the way that space is utilized. Mm -hmm.